Sea of Stars is a turn-based RPG inspired by the classics like Chrono Trigger and Super Mario RPG. It tells the story of two children of the solstice, Zael and Valir, who combine the powers of the sun and the moon to perform eclipse magic, the only force capable of fending off the monstrous creations of the evil alchemist known as the Fleshmancer. The combat is incredibly engaging, the visuals stunning, and the story is really f***ing compelling. This title really is my game of the year. Sea of Stars has received a lot of love and for very good reason. This game is like a love letter to RPGs, like someone who plays and enjoys video games actually made one. In fact, it was, as it was made by the beautiful people over at Sabotage Studios, whose mission is to create new modern games with the retro feel that they themselves grew up with. Sabotage Studios was founded in 2016 and released their first game, The Messenger, in 2018. Sea of Stars is their second major release. This review contains some minor spoilers, but nothing major in regard to the plot. There are a lot of minor details that add to the experience, and I don't want to share those either. So, I will be using mostly footage from the early game to avoid too many spoilers until we reach the story section. Now, let's get to it. But before we do, I just want to say real quick that I would appreciate if you guys liked and subscribed as this video took a lot of time to make. It was a lot of fun and I learned a lot, but I'm a part-time student and I work part-time, so it's hard to find the time to do YouTube. So just let me know what you guys think. Alright, enjoy the video. Thank you again. As I said before, the art in this game is downright gorgeous. I'm getting the same kind of vibe as from The Messenger. There are no very hard edges, everything is soft and easy to look at. The world and environments are lush with color and characterization. Each area is distinct and memorable. Every screen is a feast for the eyes and it's a dessert buffet. Not to mention the food. The designs for the main characters are simple but impactful. They are very obviously children of two different solstices, but they're united by the uniforms that they wear, and their colors are complementary to one another. Each party member who joins you is just as cool and unique in design. I'd show you them, but I don't want to spoil that part of the fun. During dialogue, characters often have a portrait to show different emotions and reactions, adding so much more depth and impact to the conversations. From smiles and laughs to solemn tears, the team did a really good job of personifying their characters. The use of lighting is impressive. Light changes during day and night cycles and lunar and solar events are seamless and beautiful, with shadows reliably and faithfully rendered. I never had any kind of visual glitch either. This next thing is a minor spoiler, but you can't get mad because it's on their website. Eventually, as a solstice warrior, you gain control over the time of day, allowing you to solve complex puzzles and change the ambiance if you so choose. I spent most of my time in the daytime. The lighting and soundtracks are better in my opinion. The monster designs are incredible too. Look at this drill bat for example. What a wacky concept, like somebody glued a normal cave bat to a drill, but in the context of the game it doesn't seem that far-fetched when there are more magical creatures than there are stars in the sea. Every monster is designed around the environment that it's in, adding to the believability. Still kinda within the realm of visuals, let's talk about indirect communication with the player. The obvious visual foreshadowing. I mean, look at these giant statues underwater. Whenever you travel via ship, it's hard not to pass by them because they're in the middle of the sea. I kept wondering what these guys would do and when I would get to see it, and I'm sure this is exactly what the developers wanted that itching curiosity, and it's so cool that they actually do something later. The music of Sea of Stars is immaculate. This is a bumpin' soundtrack I can see myself listening to far after I beat this game. You hear that? The combat music is really driving. Using banging drums and increased BPM, it makes me feel like I'm there. I can feel the intensity of the fight. The song Encounter could make anything feel like it's part of an action movie. I could really use it when it comes time to do taxes. And oh my god, the unique boss themes.
then there are more calm and soothing tracks in the towns and certain scenes to bring you back down so you can focus on the story and the environment around you. Your ears are often blessed by woodwind instruments, and every time I hear them, I can almost close my eyes and imagine a walk through meadows with rolling hills. And all of the music in the game, you get this nostalgic retro feeling. The team used Super Nintendo instruments to dominate the foreground of the music while not being bound and limited to the technology of that era, allowing them to add more significant layers to the music. The supporting instruments help drive the emotional impact as every musical score is exquisitely crafted to give you the feelings you should have in a particular moment of the story. Cornerstone to their approach to the music is the parallel soundtracks for night and day in outdoor areas. This is really nice attention to detail. I like it a lot. Good music is nothing without good sound effects. According to their website, the sound team recorded thousands of sounds to help bring the world to life. From combat sounds to item pickups, to the ground crunching beneath your feet, to the wind rustling through the trees, each and every sound is supportive to the character's journey at all times. Things like footsteps will sound different based on the environment you're in at the time definitely some of the best sound design I've ever experienced. A cool little side note is that this game features composer Yasunori Mitsuda, who people might recognize from his work on Chrono Trigger in the Xenoblade series. On top of being already really good at what he does, it's really cool that the team was able to invite him on for this project as his work on Chrono Trigger was a huge inspiration for Sea of Stars. Moving on to gameplay, we'll start with the most glaring and obvious, the turn-based combat. This has been some of the most engaging turn-based combat I've played since Persona 5. I like it a lot, and it is pretty deep, so we're gonna be here for a hot minute. For starters, when you get into a fight, it's seamless, you get down right to it, right there on the spot. Like most RPGs, you have your health and mana. When you run out of health, your character gets knocked out for a few rounds, but will get back up with half health. The number of turns until they revive is indicated by the stars above their head. Some might say this makes the game too easy, but I enjoy this decision. It's much less punishing to the player for the sake of artificial difficulty. You use your mana points to use skills to heal, gain an effect, and deal damage among other things. You gain 3 mana points back every time you deal a normal attack to an enemy. This is awesome game design. It makes every decision in combat feel viable because you're always going to benefit in some way on your turn, even if you're completely dry on mana. Later on, you'll unlock the combo bar. This fills up with nearly every action in combat, such as when you deal damage, take damage, or use a skill. You can only hold three charges for combos, so you might as well use them as you get them. They disappear after combat anyway. Some cost multiple charges, so manage your resources if necessary. Combos are capable of healing, damaging, and other effects, and you'll unlock more as you progress through the story, but there are some you can completely miss if you don't do any of the side content. Trust me, it's worth taking the time. Even if you don't really need all the combos to beat the game, the animations are cool as heck, and sometimes I use different ones just because they're cool. They also come in handy for combining different magic types for breaking more complicated locks, but more on locks in a minute. Even further beyond the combo bar, you get the ultimate meter that increases throughout the battle as you spend mana. Spend enough mana and you get to use an ultimate move that deals a lot of damage or a lot of healing, sometimes even both. There are many more combos than there are ultimates, and you will most likely be using combos to generate charge for your ultimate meter. 
You can only hold one ultimate at a time, and they too disappear after combat, so it's useful to use it the first good opportunity you get. Non-attack actions include using an item or swapping out a party member. One of your party members can use their turn to use an item to heal or restore mana for themselves or others, or they could revive an ally. Swapping party members, however, does not take your turn. If you decide you got the wrong person out, that's okay, you can still swap somebody else in. Provided the decided party member you want to switch out hasn't already taken their turn this round. Phew. I know that's a lot of information already, but hold on, as we're only halfway there. Here's some water, stay hydrated and catch your breath. Okay, here we go again. Eventually, you'll unlock live mana. Live mana is created from the innate magic of the world when you basic attack an enemy. There can only be three charges worth of live mana on the field at a time. A character can use up to three live mana charges to boost their attack, skill, or combo on their turn. That includes healing actions as well, not healing items though. I do not see a noticeable difference when it comes to ultimates. If you charge your attack with live mana, the character of choice gets a boost with their associated magic type. In case you haven't figured it out by now, for Zale it's Solar and Valir it's Lunar, but if the character has no magic stat, they instead get a boost in physical damage. Now that we've talked about magic types, we can talk about locks. Locks appear when an enemy is going to use a skill, cast a spell, whatever you want to call it. By default, enemies receive a defensive buff when locks are active. You break locks and therefore stop the enemy's turn by dealing damage of the associated type. One hit of a damage type is needed per lock. You can use skills, combos, or basic attacks with live mana to break locks. This is the part where swapping comes in really handy, so you can pull in a party member for a specific damage type. Whether you need plain blunt or slashing, or something like poison. Often, locks will have a timer to indicate how many turns until they take their action. That means every time a character takes an action, that timer decreases by one. Some enemies have damage resistances and weaknesses. This is also a good point to swap out to a different character. I love the locks mechanic of this game as it adds a really interesting layer to the challenge of combat. The turns with the looming threat feel like a puzzle in a way. A few times I sat for a couple minutes even trying to calculate how I was going to best break every lock before they attacked and it felt great being able to do it. Different enemy types have different locks and they use a variety to keep you on your toes. Timing is also a thing. Whenever you correctly time your button press you can deal an extra damage or reduce incoming damage. When you do a basic attack and time it right, you can get an additional hit. This is very important for locks because a timed basic attack breaks two of their type. In my experience, healing skills sometimes get a boost if you button mash, as timing doesn't really work for these. Your health, mana, attack damage, and defense are all stats that increase as you level up. Killing enemies grants XP. If they escape or otherwise die by any means other than your hand, no XP for you. It breaks down into health points, mana points, physical defense, physical attack, magic defense, and magic attack. Each level, some or all of the stats for each character receive a flat bonus, and you get to choose one of four other bonuses to tack on as well. This is a good addition, it helps give the player some agency and kind of lean different party members into specialties if they want to, or you can just keep them well rounded. Personally, I kept them all pretty well rounded, but every time I had the option to gain an extra mana point, I took that shit. Being able to use more skills, especially healing ones, is very strong. Grinding is non-existent in this game, and that's such a wonderful decision. There are no random encounters, so there's no worry about balancing. You gain the XP you need as you progress, and you level up at what feels like a fair and good pace. I never felt overpowered in any areas, but I could feel a difference going through an area I'd previously been in. Nicely done power scaling. That's just about everything regarding combat, I think. Wait, I nearly forgot to mention you can customize the difficulty in this game. That should save a lot of people from crying, this game is too easy, or this game is too hard. Just shut up and change your settings until you're having fun. Literally no one is watching. 
You can turn on party healing after combat and go crazy. My personal settings included giving the party a 1 in 3 chance on auto blocking incoming attacks. It wasn't game changing, but it was a nice little boost. I also turned on the indicator to show when I timed something right. All these things combined made for such an engaging system, there was never a dull moment during combat. When you're not in a fight, you can explore the world, unshackled from the platforming of old. In this game you can climb, jump, swim, and grapple. It's nice and fluid and helps create more depth in the world. Mountains feel more like mountains with more platforming and climbing. Beaches and ocean environments feel as they should with swimming mixed in there and in very creative ways. Eventually, you'll unlock the grappling hook. Excuse me, the gra- the grap- the grapplu? Man, what kind of name is that? Anyway, the grappling hook opens up the world so much more. With it, you can jet across to another platform, Spider-Man stick to a climbable surface, or get a quick hit on an enemy to enter combat with some live mana. The platforming is masterfully crafted, and in combination with beautiful and dynamic environments, it's the culmination of what game environments and level design should be. Every step you take is a conversation with the world. Every path led somewhere. Everywhere you go is a part of the adventure. My only complaint is I wish there was a little more platforming. With the grapple, there's potential for stuff like the floor is lava type of levels where you grapple from point to point to point without touching the ground. But that's just one quick thought. As you progress and explore the world, you'll find campfires with a save point nearby. Here at camp, you can rest to recover lost health and mana, and cook meals. Zael and Valir's childhood friend Garl teaches them their first recipes, and you can discover more throughout the game, finding them in chests or buying them from merchants. Food can recover health and mana for an ally, or even the whole party. You can even make a revival item. Ingredients are plentiful in the world, and I never needed to, but you can buy ingredients for a pretty low price if you don't want to take the time to collect them yourself. I may have fished a species or two into extinction in the process of gathering food. This is just another aspect that caters to the player's experience for the sake of playing the game. There's no unnecessary breakup of gameplay to go get the things you need, no grinding anywhere in sight, unless you want to. I appreciate the frequent save points in this game. Being able to make just 30 minutes of progress and having a save point or an autosave back you up is really nice. Not including something like this is the gravest sin a game developer can commit. I will die on this hill. Whenever you need some respite from saving the world and killing monsters, you can play a minigame for a spell. At fishing holes, you fight to reel in fish you can use for healing items. You can cast your rod and upon landing it in the water, a fish will swim up and latch on. To reel them in, you pull them away from the direction they're swimming to tire them out, and when they're tuckered out, you can pull them into the current flowing towards you. Pay attention, because some fish will jump out of the water, and when they do, that's your opportunity to mash the button to stun them for a few precious seconds, and to reel them in as much as you can. The difficulty depends on the fish. Some fight back really hard, and others just let you slowly drag them in. If you capture each species of fish at least once, you can unlock a secret later in the game but I'll let you find out for yourself. Then there's wheels. I love wheels. To put it simply, you use the slots to get corresponding mana for your figure, either an orange square or a blue diamond. With enough points, your figure deals damage to the opponent provided they haven't built a wall in the way. Different figures have different attacks and mana costs, and you unlock more by defeating champions. Some champions take a little work to get to, but if you defeat all of them, you can challenge the final boss of wheels, and they will reward you. Other side content includes solstice shrines hidden around the world map where you can get special rewards such as combos and cooking recipes, among more delectable treats. There are also a couple of secret bosses and areas, as well as collectible rainbow conches, and when you gather enough, you can turn them in for rewards. You have to scour every inch of the world to find all 60 for the ultimate prize, the key to getting the quote unquote true ending. There is a lot of story. Precisely 26 hours of it, assuming you ignore all the side quests. And it would be really difficult to figure out how to summarize that in both an effective and entertaining way, so I'm not going to talk about it much at all. 
I firmly believe that everyone should experience the story for themselves. It seriously is one of the best video game journeys I have ever been on. If you want to skip ahead and hear my final thoughts, go here to the time shown on screen. Where do I even begin? This story took me about 28 hours to complete, and that's because I took some time to do some side content before confronting the final boss. This game had me by the heartstrings from the very beginning. I mean, you literally watch Zale and Valir grow up, and they experience so much growth throughout the story. Oh, excuse me, I'm, I'm just getting a little emotional again. I've grown so attached to everyone, especially Garl. There will be times when this game has you laughing, and at times you'll be crying. Throughout the course of the story, I felt a real connection with the characters. It's very clear that a lot of love and care went into crafting the narrative. As I said before, this is the story of Zael and Valir, two children born on the summer and winter solstices. As infants, they were delivered to Moon Cradle so that when they come of age, they can begin training to become solstice warriors trained fighters and mages who battle against the forces of evil and the Fleshmancer, a corrupt immortal alchemist who forges monstrosities in an effort to consume and corrupt the world. After spending years honing their fighting and magical abilities, the time comes for the final test to earn the title of Solstice Warrior. So the pair embark to find the Elder Mist, a being who teaches them how to use magic without using magic. This is the live mana that we talked about earlier. A bit after beginning their journey, their childhood friend Garl appears and joins the party as the warrior cook. Armed with his trusty pot lid and heart of gold, Garl fits the role of supportive healer who has his friends backs the whole way. It is impossible not to love Garl. On your adventure going from area to area takes place on the overworld map that you at first navigate by walking, then by getting yeeted. I mean literally yeeted. This guy's name is Yeet. That's fucking hilarious. Later, you'll unlock your ship, and in the very late game, you'll unlock flying, which will get you around much, much faster and grant access to previously inaccessible areas for side content. You'll find yourself going from island to island, unlocking a few abilities along the way that you can use to access areas from previous islands. This isn't quite Metroidvania, as those new areas are not necessary for progress, but it is really neat to be like, oh shit, now I can go see what that thing from earlier was about. Most of the events happen in a linear fashion, so it's pretty clear where you need to head off to next. If you take a pause or forget, you can press a button to open up the map, which will put a star on your current objective. If this got mentioned in the game, I missed it. It took me probably eight hours to figure out that I could do this. My only complaint about this feels minor, but I wish there was some kind of mission log or indicator to give you a sentence or two to remind you what your objective is and why. Much like how the story events are linear, most combat encounters are scripted and not random. The first time you enter an area, it will be teeming with enemies, but when you visit later to perhaps gather some treasures you missed, most of the enemies will be gone. Most, but not all. Some small groups of naturally occurring enemies, as opposed to those created by the Fleshmancer, will respawn, and these can be kind of annoying, but if you're late enough in the game, you'll one-shot just about anything in your way. I think this is a good decision, as it tells the player that the world is still alive, and you're not going to endanger a species the first time you roll through. The vast majority of the work done by the development team was a home run, but I do have a couple minor gripes. For side content, I wish there was a part of the pause menu where you could check and see how many of each thing in the game you've collected. For instance, an XY counter for combos, rainbow conches, different fish species, etc. As you collect more rainbow conches and turn them in, you unlock a crow that'll let you know if you've missed an item on an island. It will give you the general area it's in, but not the precise location. This is very useful, but it would be nice to know how many out of the 60 I've collected at a given time. The map does have an indicator if you've completed an island, a star appears next to the name when you hover over it. This would be a good spot to tell you how many chests and other things you've discovered on that island. You can make it available only at the end of the game as a tool for completionists, because I imagine leaving this out was intentional, stylistic choice because everything else seems so well thought out. Back in the day, there weren't a lot of tools for completionists, just a lot of stumbling around and completing handmade lists easily taking twice as long as the game normally takes. So maybe this is just an effort to not go too far overboard. 
that's it. That's all I have for complaints. Really, just those two minor things could add a little more quality of life and finished polish. So let's move on to singing praises. The combat is fantastic, as I said before. There's nothing I would change. The variety of enemies is insane, and each one is so creatively designed with mostly unique movesets. The moves that are reused are changed to match the enemy visually, and even then, I think there are only maybe two or three that are like this. The storytelling is superb. I was on the edge of my seat for this entire adventure. I love the characters, and I love their relationships with one another. Things follow a clear literary path with proper pacing. I was never overwhelmed with information or left without a clue. I also love the level of self-awareness that this game has. There are points where something doesn't make sense if you look at it critically, but the game acknowledges this and is like, hey man, we know, this is just a limitation in the medium, here's your reason to give a shit, and keep moving forward. It was never overdone or used as a crutch, but was thoughtfully implemented in places where you'd exhale from your nose a bit when you encounter it, and I'm purposely leaving this vague so you can go experience it yourself. Lastly, I love the messages the game sends and the things we can learn and reflect on. I'd be disappointed but impressed if the devs could make you experience this tale with Zale and Valir from childhood all the way to cosmic level adventures and not say anything significant. Particularly what I'm referring to is that with enough determination, you can overcome seemingly impossible odds. You have to do what you think is right. Things might not be so clear at first, but if you keep putting one foot in front of the other, you'll find what you're meant to do. This video isn't a deep analysis, but that's what I felt like I learned on this adventure. I could keep going on and on and on about this game, but my ramblings will become less coherent the longer that I go on. So, the moral of the story is if you're still watching this, you should go play this game. Ratings are arbitrary, but if anyone cares, it's a solid 10 out of 10 all the way. I could go as far as to say I'd recommend this to someone who's never played a video game before but wants to play their first. I would recommend this as their first. Now I'm going to take a moment to thank the minds and the hands and the people attached to them who made this game. You guys are awesome and you deserve all of the praise you're getting. With your collective efforts, you created such a magical and wonderful journey and I'm truly happy to have experienced it and I can't wait to see what else you come out with. Which, by the way, I would love a review copy of your next game if you could swing that. If you guys saw this video, thank you for watching and thank you again. Thanks so much for watching. I hope this was informative and convinced you to play the game. I did my best to keep spoilers to a minimum. Perhaps I can take the time to go in depth into the story one day. So creating videos like these takes a good bit of my free time because I play, record, write, and edit all on my own. I plan to keep making them, and I have a few shorter games on the list, so I appreciate your patience between videos. Also, I would super appreciate any thoughts you guys have in the comments below. I want to improve with every video, so give me your worst. That's all for this video. See you guys next time.